gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Stephen Moffat, Super 2, and Rupert Graves. Right to him, right. Come on in here. Get on in here. Oh, can you go? Oh, you're going to switch it up. They switch it up. Might want to change those lower thirds. Hey, everybody. Welcome. Welcome back to Nerd HQ. Oh, Rupert, it's your first time with us. It is. It yeah, is. It's, it's Rupert's first time in Nerd HQ, everybody. You got some fan art over there, by the way. You've, oh, you've been immortalized on, with, pen, with pen and paper. Uh, so, you guys know the drill. You, this is your time to ask them whatever the hell you want to ask them. So, who's got a question? You guys can pick out, does anybody raise their hand? You get to choose. Uh, sometimes it's difficult when everyone's hands are in the air with phones in them, though. That's difficult. Uh, I think you have one right here. There you go. You just wait for a microphone. Now you have two. <laughs> awesome. All right. Um, in his last bow, I love that Moriarty was the last person that Sherlock saw in his mind palace. Can you give any insight to why you decided that? No. Um, uh, what, what was it? It was uh, he. He was dying. He was dying. He was. Uh, he was getting. He was. I mean, it was just the idea. That's the ultimate Satan locked in the cellar. What's in the What's in the deepest, darkest hell of? Uh, of Sherlock's mind, and that, and it would have to be Moriarty trying to drag him down, trying to destroy him even further. No more, no more thought than that. It would have to be Moriarty. He'd have to beat in order to be alive again. I guess that was uh, no more than that. But you know, if if you sort of imagine, uh, which is, is remarkably easy to do, uh, Sherlock's mind palace as a it's a sort of haunted mind palace. It would have to be because he's clinically insane. So uh, what's in the basement? Well, it's got to be. It's got to be Moriarty, hasn't it? And probably in the next cell, the Hound of the Baskervilles. You know. That's... <laughs> Stephen, I have a question. It's kind of a cross between Doctor Who and Sherlock. I know on Doctor well, Who. Well, that's never come up. <laughs> on Doctor Who, I believe you exclusively wrote for River. Is there a, a character on Sherlock that's similar? Uh, it's uh, it's no longer true that I exclusively wrote, wrote for River because uh, she's in Big Finish now, uh, the the audios. Um, there wasn't a particular rule about River at all. If uh, uh, in fact it nearly came up that we used her in an episode I wasn't going to write, so that wasn't that wasn't me just saying I, only I get to write River at all. I'd be perfectly happy for other people to do that. And no, there isn't a character on on Sherlock where I would sort of say that one's mine. That would be terribly selfish. Uh, the, the uh, I, 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 I started Molly Hooper, but we all love writing Molly. So, uh, um, and that was that was the big crime because she's not really in the originals. Uh, she has no precedent in the originals. Uh, but no, there's uh, no restrictions of that kind. You wouldn't be allowed to. It's shared universe etiquette. Everyone is allowed to play with all the toys in the box. <laughs> I've just defined just how mature the process is. You? <laughs> you knew that. Matt Smith. <laughs> hello, hello. Uh, hypothetically, for all three of you, uh, if you were on a rooftop and you were, uh, I don't know, blackmailing a, a very charming sociopath, uh, if you were to, for some reason, put a firearm into your mouth and pull the trigger, how would you fake that? <laughs> It's utterly unfakeable. Uh, not only is it impossible to blow the back of your head off in real life just for larks, uh, he's doing it in front of the cleverest detective in the world who's used to what dead bodies look like. He, he knows the impact. He probably knew the velocity of the bullet. It's unfakeable. You can't fake that. I mean, we faked it on obviously in television because Andrew absolutely refused to shoot himself. Yeah. <laughs> We had no idea until he turned up that day. Very, very, very tricky agent. And, um, but, you know, in real life, you couldn't. So, no, that's utterly, that's impossible. You just have to kill yourself. There's no other way of doing it. Very yeah. <laughs> very what? I'd be dead. What's dodgy about it? You can dodge it. Wait, what are you going to do, duck? I mean... <laughs> hypothetically, the, Rupert, how would you... The only reason you don't see the gun go right in the mouth is because we're not allowed to show that on TV anyways. <laughs> Stephen's right. 
Can't, you can't do it. You couldn't do it. No. Impossible. Is Lestrade ever wrong? <laughs> right over there. Hi. Can I stand up? Oh, okay. Um, my question is for Rupert. I was wondering what was your favorite scene to film during Sherlock, and what was your most difficult scene to film, and how did you prepare for it? Uh, well, um, my favorite scene probably is the. Uh, I like because I don't, I don't often get too much to say. Uh, I've got, it's nice doing lots of kind of um, reacting stuff. So it was when I saw, when, when, when I, I think when, when Lestrade first saw uh, the, um, Sherlock was okay and the underground car park was great. I liked all that. Um, and and I, I, I don't really, I just learn my lines really and turn up. And then, uh, <laughs> I do. <laughs> and I went to a police station to look at, see how they do it. Um, but you, you kind of, actually the kind of art really is to react in the moment really. So it depends very much on what um, Benedict's doing and, the other people are doing. There's a lovely scene, isn't there, in the special, which obviously you haven't seen, which you, you do with the... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, oh well, yeah. I did, it's the first scene, isn't it? Proper scene between Lestrade and Mrs. Hudson. Yeah, that was great. We've been kind of friends for a while, Una and I, and it was great to, have the, uh, to, have to uh, get to act together. That was lovely. <coughs> right there. So, Sue and Steve, I've been a fan since Coupling. And I'm, I'm curious, um, <laughs> how much of Stephen and Sue are actually in Susan and Steve? And Sue, how did you feel about that version of you on screen? There's, there's quite a lot of us in that, isn't there? Some, quite a lot of it's based on yeah. truth. And but we're, we're not, not telling, telling you which. which. <laughs> Our son watched it recently and he really liked it and he just kept saying, did that happen? And we said, not covering it. It's not happening. <laughs> but in the UK, it took till the third series, I think, for the journalists to realise it was based on us, even though we used the same names. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, journalists used to say to us, are any of the characters based on you two? And we said, we didn't actually change the names. I mean, it's... <laughs> Is there a reason you were transferred from the investigative journalism section? <laughs> but actually, all on, the, on the last series, all the birth of um, the baby and me asking, telling you to ask me three times for... Oh, yeah, <laughs> if you remember the very, very last one where uh, uh, Susan asked Steve, I want you to check with me three times whether I really want an epidural, if I'm really serious about it. And she ends up saying, just get me a fucking epidural. <laughs> that happened. Uh, and I also had to park the car when I was in labor because uh, you couldn't I'm a reverse. terrible driver. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'd learned to drive specifically to drive Sue to the, uh, the hospital we got there. And I couldn't for the life of me get the car reversed in. <laughs> so Sue, you know, with fairly regular contraction says, oh, for fuck's sake, out of the way. <laughs> Least manly man in history gets out in front of people as my wife is going, ah, ah, and I'm standing going. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> I love the insight I just got into your life. I appreciate it. Thank well, there's a box set available. Um, <laughs> you know, it's still out there. You can download it. It's, all, it's terrific stuff. Uh, yeah, right down. Let's let's go. Let's go with you right in the front here. <laughs> Mr. Moffat, huge fan. Love oh, your work. Um, you. My question is for all of you. I'm wondering, in your everyday life, are you more of a Sherlock or a Watson? Watson. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, because Sherlock's really clever. <laughs> I mean, that's it. I wish I could be like Sherlock Holmes, but I'm too stupid. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, I can't. <laughs> Sue will come into the room crying and I say, uh, something's, uh, something's wrong, isn't it? <laughs> isn't it? This, is, this is the thing you do, isn't it? Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had floating text. <laughs> it just said, you twat. <laughs> <laughs> Rupert, Lestrade. I'm, I'm, I'm too stupid even to be Watson, I'm just Lestrade. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like to think I'm a bit Sherlocky. 
I like to kind of deduce people's lives in, in kind of supermarkets by looking at their trolleys and seeing what they've got in them. <laughs> and then working out how many people in their family and if they cook well and stuff. That's what I do. Yeah. I would confirm that my wife is the closest to a genius sociopath among us. <laughs> <laughs> Compliment. Uh, one way or the other. <laughs> no, you probably are the most Sherlock here, actually, though. I, in a nice way. Sherlock's nice, really. Uh, but you, you are probably the, uh, the best sensible thinker of, of all of us. Uh, I see your hand in the back right there. Oh, I can see you now. <laughs> Okay, I got kind of two questions for you, Rupert. First question, what is Lestrade's ideal date? Because, <laughs> because I remember at Sherlock, you said something about him living in a sad little bachelor pad surrounded by takeaway. And the second question is, how has Sherlock's relationship with Lestrade changed since he's come back from the dead? Are they related questions? <laughs> <laughs> there was nothing in the rules about that. Mike Mycroft is, is the Strahd's date, no. <laughs> no, no! <laughs> no! <laughs> uh, maybe Molly Hooper, if you look at, um, uh, look at, look at uh, Strahd's face when she takes her coat off when she comes to the Christmas party. Um, and what was the other, sorry, the other question. I, was, I told you I was thick. How has Sherlock and Lestrade's relationship changed? I don't really know yet, because we haven't had enough. Um, we've kind of... <laughs> Thanks. Well, we bounced back to the Victorian era, and all that's kind of. We'll, we'll wait for the um, for the fourth uh, series to come along and see how that um, changes. But it, that I think it will deepen their um, their love. <laughs> Did you just say get it? <laughs> What's wrong with you people? Uh, right down, right down there, right in the front. How did you want the audience to feel right at the end of his last vow? Um, well, I suppose uh, it looked like it was the final end, the final end, the final end, it's off and off and off, and then surprise, he's getting called back. Uh, so just, you know, uh, to, to, to put Sherlock apparently in an inescapable situation and for him to uh, to be offered, bizarrely enough, a way out because Molly Arty apparently has missed her. Um, uh, also, that's how you fake it. Yeah. <laughs> that? Um, yeah, I don't swallow. Uh, it's, uh, okay. <laughs> But you know, it's, I mean, basically, you always want. I mean, I, I, this sounds awful, and as opposed to everything else I've said so far. Uh, but you just want people to be very keen to watch it again. That's what you want. Oh, I can't wait to see what happens next. Is what you want people to be thinking, because you want to show up again. So that, is, I guess, <laughs> not very detailed. <laughs> do, do, would, do you guys want to pick them? Oh, right. I can pick them for you if you want to. Um, my question is, I've just literally forgotten my question. No. Um, <laughs> Are you asking what your question is? Yes. Yeah. What haven't you been asking? No. Um, what, it's been a very family affair with bringing uh, Benedict's parents in um, and with Watson's wife being mm. Martin's wife. Any other family members going to be coming up in the next episodes that we might expect to see? Our son's in it. Yes. Yeah. Oh, well, we, we don't specifically do that. We don't, we don't say, all right, who, who wants to go around the Christmas table? Right? <laughs> um, it, it, it has, I mean, I don't particularly know why the ecology of Charlotte works that way. Uh, it's always been a very small, close-knit, frequently related or copulating uh, uh, group of people. I think there's one point we counted, there were sort of, in effect, four or five married couples around the table at one point, or couples of some kind. Uh, so I don't know why. But it's a show that grew out of a, a friendship and a marriage. So I suppose that's just the ecology of it. But we don't specifically think, you know, we've got a new villain. Can we see photographs of your relatives? Uh, <laughs> so maybe we should. It's been working well for us. I don't know. 
Maybe we should adopt the people who aren't part of our family. We should... Rupert, do you fancy being adopted? We could adopt you. Yes, I've got lots of extended family waiting, hopefully, outside the gates of the studio. <laughs> but they haven't been taken up yet, but they were <laughs> It's actually a canny device of keeping the budget down by making everyone kind of double up in bedrooms. <laughs> Always the producer. <laughs> oh, yes, hang on. That one there. Hi, Mr. Moffat. Um, Hello. You've done episodes um, based around what are arguably the most um, well-known stories, the woman, the hound, the professor. Going forward, how do you decide what stories you want to focus on? Well, to be honest, uh, we decided to do uh, the, the Woman, the Hound, and the Professor in Series 2 because, you know, uh, uh, as, we, as Mark and I always say, to hell with deferred pleasure, get on with it now. Um, and they're, they're the three biggies. They're the three people are always going to be asking us about until we do them. So we did them. There is a fund of material that no one ever touches in Sherlock Holmes. Everyone's done the Hound of the Baskervilles. Most people do Moriarty. Irene Adler isn't a first for us, you know, isn't a first for... Uh, uh, so uh, th there's a whole bunch of other stories, ideas, villains that are in there. I'm not telling you which ones uh, are taking our attention at the moment, but there's a, there's a bunch of other stuff. There are 60 stories. There's only one hound. There's only one story that Moriarty really appears in. Irene Adler barely shows up in A Scandal in Bohemia. So, you know, there's a whole bunch of things that uh, we can do. And we can make up new stories, we can combine stories into... I mean, very few of those stories are long enough to make anything approaching a film. They barely make it to... Uh, in, the, in the wonderful Granada series, they had their work cut out trying to expand some of those stories even to an hour. Uh, so, um, the, the, but there is a fund of great ideas. Great ideas, great mysteries, great villains, great openers, great gags, really, for us to use. We won't run out because, frankly, we make the show so incredibly slowly. <laughs> Yesterday you said that if you don't know the end of your story, you're going to end up in a big mess. Yeah. Was that specifically for the episodes, for the series, or for the show's final end? Do you know where it's going? Um, it's specifically for an episode, really, because obviously you can't have a final end for a, a, a TV show while you're still making it. You don't know how it's going to go on. I'd be in real trouble if I had one for Doctor Who, wouldn't I? <laughs> um, I mean, generally speaking, as Mark always says, the, the spoilers here are, are all over 100 years old. And close your ears, but he ends up on the Sussex Downs keeping bees. That's where he goes. <laughs> That's what happens. I don't know why. I've never figured that one out. I get, he gets very, very bored if criminals aren't committing enough crimes. But then he thinks, I know, I'll keep bees. You think, what? <laughs> really? <laughs> Watson never says, isn't that, no disrespect, fucking boring? <laughs> I mean, you've been solving murders to stave off a cocaine problem and now just putting on a stupid hat and wandering around some small huts that buzz a lot is enough for you, <laughs> twat. But um, <laughs> anyway, uh, so no, we don't know where, where it ends, but that is ultimately where it ends. That hand there, that... Hello. Hello. Lestrade, could we ask you to say, you bastard? <laughs> You bastard. <laughs> Do you want it for your ringtone? You'll come over with the microphone. Uh, <laughs> Hi, Stephen. Um, well, I'm not used to this. Uh, will the sibling, the third sibling, make an appearance? What third sibling? Of Mycroft and Sherlock. Who said there was one? <laughs> you did. No, I didn't. What, a, what about the other one? Who says that refers to a sibling? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you bastard. <laughs> You've got your routine now, haven't you? There we go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> words is all I need. That blue hand there, it looks blue. I'm sure it's not really blue. Hi. Um, so you arguably have two very clever characters in Sherlock and Doctor Who. 
And I was wondering if you're ever making stories for either one of them and thinking, you know, maybe this is better set for Doctor Who or vice versa. No, because they're such different things. I mean, I know there are, I suppose there are elements of the Victorian adventurer and uh, eccentric boffin about all, both of them, but uh, I, don't, I never think of them as the same at all. Uh, and, you know, Sherlock, in the end, is having, is having various emotional crises while pretending to do detective work uh, and Doctor Who's fighting monsters. So they don't, they don't really... Sometimes... Uh, and you have, to, you have to be... Uh, Mark and I sit and have discussions about this because we both write both. Um, there are areas where those characters can think or behave slight, in slightly similar ways. Because, in fact, one of the very first notes that Sidney Newman gave... Verity Lambert, when they were making Doctor Who for the first time, was make that old guy more like Sherlock Holmes. He's Sherlock Holmes in space. So we can't, just because we do both shows, shy away from those aspects of the Doctor that are consciously patterned after Sherlock Holmes. We have to, we have to embrace them and say, yes, he, sometimes he can look around a room and see things. And sometimes he can be a bit, you know, emotionally autistic or whatever. Uh, so, but, you know, in general, actually, they are quite different characters. But there are, you know, there, there are superficial resemblances that are not insubstantial, and we can't run away from them. Uh, lady in blue there. I don't know if you are a lady in blue. You are, well, you're a lady and you're in blue, so that was, thank Christ for that. Um, uh, first of all, I just wanted to say, Rupert, I have loved you since Freddie Honeychurch in Room with a View. Thank you. <laughs> loved you. Um, my question is for all of you. Um, what um, did you want to stand out with your Lestrade as opposed to other portrayals of Lestrade? Well, I, I approached the, uh, the part very simply. I just thought I wanted to be a kind of um, um, copper that you could believe was a copper um, and, and kind of act as a kind of sounding board for, for um, Sherlock's kind of brilliance, really. So I just approached it um, just really soberly as a, as, a, as a policeman, a credible policeman. Uh, in terms of uh, you know uh, writing the part, uh, the, uh, Lestrade in the original varies quite a lot, from being a sort of you know a, a complete idiot and rather aggressive to being uh, actually rather a fine man and uh, and the man that uh, uh, Holmes calls the best of the Scotland Yarders. Uh, but the, our key for it was there's a wonderful story called the Six Napoleons, uh, and and in it. Uh, uh, Sherlock Holmes, I think, as I recall, being slightly snide about something, or, and uh, Lestrade turns to him and says, you think that we don't like you. You think that uh, we're jealous of you. Well, we're not. If you came around Scotland Yard, every single one of us would shake your hand. And that was the key to the relationship for, uh, for Mark and me, was thinking, this is a man who hugely admires Sherlock Holmes, has, um, has sufficient confidence in his own ability that he doesn't mind admitting that somebody else is better and going to them for help, which, which is, uh, makes him a bigger man than Sherlock Holmes who can't bear to admit that his brother is smarter than him. Um, so, uh, we, we, uh, so the idea is that uh, Sherlock Holmes is dismissive of a man who genuinely likes him and admires him because he, because he just assumes that Lestrade is jealous or angry, and he's not at all. He's a complete ally, and he's a, 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 he's a fine and clever copper. You also changed the writing very slightly, didn't you, from, from the pilot to the main thing? Cause... Uh, one of the... We did... Um, we did uh, audience research on our pilot, and uh, people complained that uh, um, uh, the, the police were too stupid. So we, saw, we told Rupert, could you just clever the fuck up a bit? Um, uh, and if in doubt, just say, you bastard. Uh, and, uh, and so we did, we, made, we did make, try and make sure that he was actually rather wise, and we gave him that beat in the first episode where he says Sherlock Holmes is a great man, and one day, if we're very lucky, he might be a good one. Uh, which is the arc of the series. Uh, so Lestrade absolutely gets it. He gets what Sherlock Holmes can be uh, on a good day and what he might be on a bad day. So uh, that, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's quite a key character, actually. Lady at the back there just put her hand up a second ago. Hi. Uh, one of my favorite things about the show is the balance of comedy and drama. And I was wondering if you could just talk about the comedy side, writing, or even filming in the show. Um, well, both Mark and I, uh, our background is in comedy. That's what we... Uh, uh, and if, if your background's in comedy, you have a tendency, if a scene is not doing anything else to make it funny, uh, you just do think, well, there's a gap here, people just talking about the plot, let's stick some gags in and they might fall asleep. 
but also in the original stories, uh, and this is the most neglected aspect of Doyle's work, the stories are funny. There's lots of jokes in them. Uh, the interaction between Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson is genuinely humorous. Laugh out loud at times, the, uh, the beginning of the Valley of Fear, the beginning of the Dancing Men. Mm. Very, very good comedy stuff in there. Uh, and our favorite version, I think uh, the single best Sherlock Holmes movie ever made, uh, and the most beautiful and the most clever, uh, is The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes uh, by Billy Wilder, which, uh, and Izzy Diamond, which is a straightforward comedy. It is a comedy, and yet it captures more of Sherlock Holmes uh, possibly than any other movie version. Again, Rathbone and Bruce are bloody hilarious. Uh, so, you know, comedy, there's a lot of humor in Sherlock Holmes. And when people miss that, they miss a whole area of, of that show. And I'll come right down to it, Mark and I are comedy tarts, so there you go. <laughs> but I think it's because you come from comedy, I think actually it goes in quite effortlessly, the comedy. I think sometimes trying to jam in a funny bit in a drama is much harder, but you do it, well, you do it very well. <laughs> well, it's great if you're a comedy writer doing drama because uh, uh, you get such compliments for the jokes. They're saying, look, at you, you had four jokes, and they say, yes, I am a genius. Uh, but, uh, but the truth is, if you're if you an old sitcom hack like me, you're used to the idea, I mean, three jokes a page. We all pretend we don't do that, but we do. And, uh, you know, that's, that's really hard. So once, you, once you've exercised that muscle, uh, it's really bloody useful in, in the dull bits in drama to get, the, to get your comedy trousers on. There aren't actually trousers, but I am contemplating it. <laughs> they did that. Hello there. Um, Hello. So I absolutely love Sherlock and Mycroft's relationship and how it grew in the most recent season. Can we expect more of that? And kind of a peek in their real, they, Sherlock kind of like depends on Mycroft and it's like a vulnerability that has been more expressed. Can we see more? Hopefully. We haven't written the next series yet, but I'm very much assuming that, that we will. I mean, that's something that's... Uh, they, they didn't... It, it was quite late on that we started working it that way. Uh, because uh, Scandal in Belgravia was the third one we made of the second series, and that's the first time we saw, really, Mycroft in the caring role. You know, I mean, he's a, he's a, he's a chilly old reptile, but he, he actually cares for his brother. Uh, and I, I found it a very useful device, and so did Mark. Uh, we have understanding where Sherlock Holmes fits in the world. He's the, he's the renegade, posh, younger son who should be in the foreign office or in the civil service or in some incredibly high-paid job who one day came home and said, I've decided to be a private detective. <laughs> uh, and they say, oh, God, he's, is he back on the drugs? That's who he is. And, and having Mycroft as this guy saying, someday I'll get him to a university and make him a mathematician uh, is, uh, is a useful way of pegging him. But there is, there is genuine care there. We, that is sort of not in the original, really. Uh, it, it comes slightly from the Billy Wilder version in uh, Private Life of Sherlock Holmes, where the, 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 the relationship is more combative. And rather to our own surprise, we added quite a strong compassionate element to it as well. It just sort of evolved, really. And I assume we'll continue to do so. Steve, you said, you kind of alluded earlier that Sherlock can't admit that Mycroft is more intelligent than him. Mm -hmm. Is Mycroft more intelligent than Sherlock? Yes. I mean, that's, a, that's an absolute fact of the original stories, that, that Mycroft is the smarter brother. I should probably read more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, but he doesn't, have, he doesn't have Sherlock's, you know, um, other abilities. He doesn't have Sherlock's energy. He doesn't have his, uh, his you know, much denied but real... Uh, need to fight for justice and all that and to help people, which, you know, underneath underneath all of Sherlock's pretense is there. He is keeping the world safe. That's what he is. He's a hero. He doesn't have any of those things. And he couldn't beat anyone in a fight, which Sherlock can do. So, uh, But he is, yeah, uh, Mycroft is the smarter brother. And that's in the, uh, in the original stories. Sherlock is quite relaxed about that. In our version, Sherlock's genuinely... Well, hilariously, Actually, Sherlock, is, yeah, <laughs> Sherlock is pissed off about Mycroft being smarter than him, but he, he's got it under control. Benedict is furious. <laughs> <laughs> and he's constantly saying, Mycroft's not really smarter than me, and we're, and we're saying, yeah, yeah, he is. Not only, not only is Mycroft smarter than Sherlock, uh, but you know, Mark's smarter than you. I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, he's smarter than everybody, Mark. That's all right. <laughs> but he is, he is quite vain about okay. it. <laughs> When Mycroft is relying on Sherlock's help in so many of these 
cases then? Is it is it not just because of his intelligence? Because Mycroft could figure it out himself? Is because he's got all these other elements? Yeah, it's not talents. just I mean, uh, as a matter of sheer brain power. If you could measure that uh, perfectly, uh, Mycroft's got the better equipment. But he doesn't have any of the experience, the understanding, the energy, the learning. He hasn't turned himself into the greatest detective, gentleman, fighter in the world. He hasn't had any of those things. So he couldn't he couldn't do what Sherlock Holmes can do. But in that one area, he yes, he's just as he's slightly taller. Again, really, <laughs> uh, he is slightly smarter. Do you yeah. remember that? Mycroft doesn't like to do the leg work. Either. No, he doesn't. No. Do you remember in the second series? <laughs> Are you sure Benedict you want to do said this? To, said to Mark, <laughs> "When did you get taller than me?" Uh, and, and Mark saying, "Well, like, I was always taller than you." <laughs> Anyway, that was the answer. <laughs> uh, next question. Uh, lady in the interesting hat. The stripy hat, that one there. Yeah. Yes, you, yeah. Oh, I didn't know if it was a hat. It's a hat, it's a hoodie. It's, it's your covering your head. Hoodie, darling. Okay. Uh, Modern world. <laughs> Obviously, this is a show that appeals to a wide fan base and has touched a lot of people. So what has most surprised and delighted you, all of you, about the fan response to this show? Um, I never was aware before, and I think I'm right in saying this vaguely, that loads and loads and loads of women were really into Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> It wasn't something you, when you were younger, that you mentioned to women saying, I too like Sherlock Holmes, uh, let's go out. That wouldn't have been something that really worked. Or Doctor Who, I'm a Sherlock Holmes and Doctor Who fan. You'll probably like me. That didn't work, trust me. <laughs> I was a virgin till I was 42. Um, and, and it carried on. Um, the, so, um, what's the most funny? Uh, the, uh, I, I, the thing that most delights me, anyway, is, the, is, the, is always the most creative, is the creative response. Uh, the fact that people do their own versions, uh, make their own art, make up their own stories. Um, because, I mean, as, as I keep saying, that's like, that, that's like hothousing talent, I think. Uh, fan fiction, fan art, all these things. That is the way to learn how to do the job. It really, really is. Uh, so I, I, I like that. I like the, the, the extraordinary creative response to it. Not just passively consuming, uh, uh, but saying, you know what, I'm going to have a go at it. I'm going to try and do it. Uh, because that's the first step to doing it for real. Uh, so that, that probably. Yeah, that's true. Well, the, the Sherlock event was great. I've never been to any of these uh, comic cons before. But there was a uh, shirt. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, but it's the passion and, and, and the creativity is, 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 is astonishing. And it's um, as it should be. It's a lovely symbiotic relationship between the material and the, and the fan base, which is, is, is great. Yeah, and I, th I think it's also the self-policing that everybody does as well. You know, the set lock. So people turn up for the shooting, but if you don't want to see it, then you don't have to because you've all decided to put it on one particular hashtag. And food. Get lots of food, don't we? <laughs> lots of fan food. No, at the convention we did, that you, didn't, you did a, um, an interview the day before and said you're not allowed to buy yourself chocolate, you had to be given chocolate. Conveniently, a day before we had the convention. So everyone turned up for Stephen, just bars and bars of chocolate. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> Kept us going for weeks. <laughs> It's true, I have this rule, I can never ever buy myself chocolate because I like it too much, but I'm allowed to steal it from other people or get it as a gift. I went, went also when Mark Gatiss found out about that, he just wandered around with a packet of Maltesers in his pocket and just say, Stephen, do you want chocolate? <laughs> I, I felt like a dog being trained. <laughs> uh, woman with red hair there, red hair woman. Is it real red hair? <laughs> Hi, guys. Um, just wondering, obviously, it's taken quite a long time to get through series. And do you find that difficult from a production point of view, that it is so spaced out? Is it difficult to kind of get into a groove with shooting and with production side of it? Or you just, you all fall together pretty easily? Um, it's it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. The set looks a bit dodgy when we bring it back out again. and It might have been the flood or something, but... Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, you can't do anything because the, the scripts don't get there any sooner. 
I mean, you know, even if you've got a two-year gap, you still get the scripts. <laughs> <laughs> I may not have mentioned it, darling. So I get on when with you're not things. looking, I make Doctor Who. <laughs> And I'm learning to drive. Uh, <laughs> but it is, it's a lovely family film when we all get back and do our read-throughs, isn't it? Sort of... It has the strange result that every time that we, we turn up and make the show, it actually does feel like we're doing a reunion show. <laughs> say, oh, we're back again. I never thought I'd see you again. And we all <laughs> fall into, into each other's arms, sobbing. And we think, oh, this is ridiculous. We do this every year. So, <laughs> or every, and not every year, let's be honest. <laughs> it's not every year. Oh, the giddy speed that would be. <laughs> Right, who's next? Uh, that hand that just went up there, that's a man! It's a man! <laughs> Have you ever lucked out today, my boy? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. From a writing standpoint, how do you determine how much Lestrade, Mrs. Hudson, and Mycroft put in, and love Mrs. Hudson? Um, well, that was tactless, wasn't it, Rupert? Yeah. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> Call him a bastard. <laughs> Go <on. laughs> Um... Uh, well, no, it just, it just as it arises in the story, really. Uh, originally, uh, we were going to stick with the story idea that Lestrade, who's he's only in, actually, has a surprisingly small number of the stories, and there's loads of other different policemen turning up, and obviously, logically, it wouldn't always be the same inspector that Sherlock Holmes was dealing with. But then we, had an, we did an episode without Roper, and frankly, it felt wrong. It didn't, it didn't feel right at all. So we just thought... So Mark and I put our heads together and thought we just had a, this idea that whenever Sherlock Holmes collides with the police, uh, a, the word goes out to Lestrade, go there. Go there and stop all the police punching him, right? Yeah, it's your job. <laughs> so even if he goes to Dartmoor, Lestrade turns up saying, oh, I've just come home from holiday, you bastard. <laughs> uh, and, and so, so that, uh, Mrs. Hudson, well, you know, she doesn't speak in the original, as we referenced in that piece, she just doesn't speak. Uh, but we've got we've got you know Stubbs, one of the uh, you know one of the huge comedy talents of all time. So we have to give her loads of stuff, and we've just uh, uh, Mark and I have just uh, delighted in giving her more and more of a lurid backstory, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is great. Um, uh, the other sort of ancillary characters like Molly Hooper uh, was never intended to be a continuing character, uh, but you know uh, she was intended literally for that one scene, which it was as to establish Sherlock not even noticing that this girl's in, uh, in love with him uh, and not even caring and not even being cruel to her, just not noticing. Uh, but, you know, she was so great. Lou Brilli was so great. And, it, and it, it instantly put Sherlock Holmes in the modern world that there was a girl like that there. And that character has become so, so much more complicated and so much more powerful over time that you end up using her a lot, even though it's the one thing we said we'd never do, was introduce a new character. And we did. <laughs> We've now forgotten that she's not in the original. <laughs> Lady over there, just put her hand up. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my question is, I've heard from in interviews with other writers and showrunners that when writing in television, you don't necessarily, you know, the characters will make changes, but in the end, the consistency is what people are looking for. So no matter how far they progress, the changes they make, in the end, they're kind of going to wind up in the same spot they were in the beginning, or the same type of person. Mm -hmm. So with all the changes we've seen Sherlock make, is that sort of a theory that you subscribe to? Or is there room, since you're saying that in the end, we know where he's going to wind up? Um, you know, it's, in general, that comes from the right place. A TV series has to deliver you know, what it promises to deliver. You don't want everyone to have uh, radically changed. But I think it's... I think it's an idea that's coming under uh, vigorous attack over time. If it things like Breaking Bad, which is all about a character that he never goes back into his box and so on. And we do have a, we have a, a general arc for Sherlock that exists in the original, is that he starts very, very cold-blooded and unlikable and humorless and becomes progressively, humanized is too strong, but he, uh, he, he certainly becomes uh, uh, wiser, funnier, uh, more agreeable with occasional moments where he's absolutely terrifying. But we have, um, you know, I, I think it would be a shame if you have huge events happening in people's lives and it, it, it leaves them completely unchanged. But you do, in the end, want them to get back to 221B and get a new client and solve a crime. So it's, it's a balance. Uh, we have time for one, maybe two more questions. Make them fantastic. Who hasn't spoken? <laughs> Who's next? Uh, 
Who's been longing to speak the most? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm in the front row, so I think you should. Yeah. It was a late hand. Um, I'm it? sorry, I know. So, Sherlock Holmes' best man speech might be the most iconic best man speech ever in television. Wondering what the best man and maid of honor speeches were like at your wedding. The best man speech. Oh, my, my wedding. Uh, and your my wedding. wedding. <laughs> I've had two, darling, be more specific. Yes, actually, the best man speech at our wedding. Oh, it's um, brilliant. He had yeah. the same best man at both his weddings. And uh, that was great. so he said, what was it? <laughs> <laughs> to the virtues, hello and welcome to the Moffats, here we are again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Um, I've lasted uh, longer. I've been a best man many times, actually, or well, three times. Uh, so I'm, I, I'm quite, I'm quite good at give, giving best man speeches. So I, uh, I wrote most of that speech. Uh, I like, I, so I am actually available for being a best man, even if I don't know you very well. Uh, because <laughs> I'm good at that bit. Uh, <laughs> Rupert, what's your best man speech like? I didn't have one. You know? No, I got married uh, in a little park in Australia um, with eleven people. And no best man. You married 11 people in a park. <laughs> I did. I married Is them. that why you have so many children? <laughs> okay. I understand that. You bastard. Um, okay, I, I, do we have one more then? Do we have one, uh, one more question. Uh, uh, that lady's being pointed at. Oh, you're being pointed well, she at. She doesn't know because she's being pointed at. She doesn't even want to ask a question. <laughs> All right. Has anyone got a great question? Oh, yeah, you've got a great question. Hooray. Um... My question is, in The Resident Patient, there's a murderer named Moffat, so I was wondering if you'd ever think of making a cameo as yourself. <laughs> um, and killing yeah. someone. <laughs> yeah, killing someone. <laughs> uh, just, just because I got the same name. Um, uh, well, the, 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 the problem with that would be I'm really shit at acting. Uh, and I think it would be rather noticeable. I think in terms of... In terms of quality control, we've got a, a, an absolutely stellar, brilliant cast, and then a, a, a you know a, a fat bloke who looks like he's won a competition isn't gonna isn't gonna fit in very well. <laughs> Not since Lazenby played Bond. Uh, <laughs> all the Lazenby wine, give it up. He was crap. <laughs> um, we, we, we've got time for a 24 seconds. We got question. about 23 seconds. All right, go, go, go. It's a man, it's a man, it's a man. <laughs> uh, does anybody ever come up to you on the street and say, like, God damn you, Moffat, or curse you, or...? <laughs> well, no, people are generally very nice. <laughs> I, know want, I know they want your picture, but, like, no one ever... Well, why would they... No, I hope not. Oh, they shouldn't. <laughs> because he's a shit driver? <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that's our time. Let's hear it. For Steven and Rupert and so give it up for these guys. <laughs>